We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussions around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. So I made a promise to myself that I would come back a better person than uh, I ever was. That's Dinesh Palapana, OAM, 2021 Queensland Australian of the Year. And this is Reframe of Mind. The podcast that cuts through the platitudes and gets to the core of living authentically, challenging our assumptions and improving mental health with the guidance of good science, philosophy and learning from other people's lived experiences. We're your hosts, Andy Leroy and Louise Poole. Dinesh Palapana is a doctor, a lawyer, scientist and disability advocate and the first person with a spinal cord injury to graduate from medicine in Queensland. Dinesh had to challenge other people's perceptions about his capabilities while overcoming his own personal challenges as he recovered from the accident that led to quadriplegia. Moving towards his personal why is what drove and continues to drive Dinesh's success and he started by telling us how he found that. When I was going through law school, I suffered from depression and anxiety and panic disorder and it got quite bad. That was the reason I ended up choosing medicine as a career. Um, And so I finished law school, started med school. And then in medical school, I had a car accident that caused a spinal cord injury and quadriplegia. So I lost the use of my hands and everything below the chest. And I spent about seven months in hospital and another four years uh, recovering from the various other physical and social things. And then came back to medical school in uh, 2015. And now this is my fifth year as a doctor. And I work in the busiest emergency department in Australia. And I uh, am a spinal cord injury researcher. I do a bit of work around disability as well. So life is good. That's quite the journey, Dinesh. I mean, from, <laughs> <laughs> from from your beginnings in Sri Lanka and, and actually coming to Australia because of you know what was happening around that time as well to come through now to being a practicing doctor in a hospital um, who has quadriplegia. There are so many things in there to unpack and I'm sure 40 minutes isn't going to do us justice. But um, I suppose one of the things that stood out to me in you know reading about your story and, and what you've been through and who you are, one of the things that stood out was the challenge you faced around other people's perceptions of what you're capable of. Was that um, something that you didn't expect when you were actually trying to deal with everything else that you were dealing with? There are many facets to that, actually, because... Um, I've got to say that before I had the injury, I had no idea what life was like for someone with a disability, right? So when I used to look at someone uh, using a wheelchair, I just thought, okay, that that must be difficult having paralysis because you you see the physical thing, right? But the problem goes a lot deeper than that. There's uh, problems with lung function. There's problems with uh, skin. There's problems with gastrointestinal function. And then there's all these other social things like employment and education and discrimination that goes on. So I had no idea about the breadth of the challenges that people face. And I think most people don't really realize that either. So when I first had the injury, I was just suddenly, it was suddenly a very steep learning curve about all these things that were an issue. And even within myself, I wasn't sure what my capabilities would be. And I wasn't sure what I would be able to do so even in my own head, I had some, some doubts about what um, life would look like and what my capabilities are. So if I had those doubts, then other people had all these uh, things in their minds as well. So, I, I, you know, a lot of people told me, even, even some of my close friends said, I think medical school is going to be really hard for you. I mean, this journey is probably something that you don't want to take and you should think about doing something a bit easier. So there were a lot of things from even people close to me that weren't so enabling for me to take the journey. But there's one thing that uh, I was actually thinking about this last night, and that is you know, in our lives, we have so many people having an opinion about what we should do. Right? There are so many opinions about how we should live our life how you should raise your kids or how you should, uh, what job you should do or where you should live and all these different things. There are different opinions about how you should live your life. 
and people coming in and out of your life and um, make suggestions. And there are social pressures as well. So there's society telling us what to do. But at the end of the day, when you look back at life, when you're at the end of the road, there's only one person who you can hold to account and that's you. So I decided not to listen to anyone and pursue my dream, which uh, turned out to be the best thing that I ever did. How did you manage to push through to that level of, I'm actually going to back myself and actually not listen to these other voices that maybe for, for with all the best intentions, trying to, you know, in their eyes, maybe protect you from disappointment. But had you listened to their guidance, you wouldn't be where you are today. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like you said, some people have the best intentions for us. But at the same time, you know, I think we can appreciate them and we can um, think about the input because all viewpoints are worth considering because we can learn something from it, right? But again, I think it's really important to remember that one of my friends actually told me recently that this is not a rehearsal. Life is happening and you only get one shot at it. We all see time passing by so quickly, right? We're like, oh my God, how quick's the year gone? And then we go, oh my God, how quick have the years gone? And suddenly you're uh, at a point where you're looking back and you're like, oh my God, I missed so much of life. So in all those times, are the people that told you uh, what to do and what to, to do, are they there? They're not. It's just you. So that, that's really the uh, thought that kept me going because I knew that in a few years, all these people, they won't be around and they'll be, just be living their own lives. So why should I listen to that Really, the only person that, that I really give a lot of thought to is what whatever my mom says, because she's been such a close part of my life since, well, I've known her all my life. So, <laughs> but um, I think uh, I think that that's one of the most important things. So you got to carve out your own life. You got to. I think you have to remember that uh, to be happy, truly happy, you can't get caught up in the cogs and wheels of society and you can't get thrown into the passing fancies of the world and whatever is fashionable at the moment you just gotta do what makes you happy and what makes you fulfilled and to pursue your why if you do that i think you'll most of us will end up in a pretty good place and that's happiness when you talk about that that feeling, that voice inside that even when everyone was saying, you know, this is something that you should not pursue, how loud was that voice in you? Was that a really visceral, strong gut reaction that says, this is me and my path and I'm going to continue with this? Or was it something that you had to kind of cultivate and grow through mm -hmm. uh, finding another way to balance and say, well, I've, I've got to not listen to that. Like, is, was it more of a conscious thing or was it just so overwhelming that this is the path, no one's going to naysay you out of it? No, it was actually a grind. It was a grind. Like, uh, I think um, these days it's I'm a lot more, okay, because I've travelled that path and so now I can say, no, you know what, like I understand your advice and I've learned something from it, but I feel that this is the right thing to do and I'm going to do it. But Early on in the piece, it was it was really a grind. I was thinking, oh man, maybe maybe they're right. Maybe I could. I even had some job offers to keep working as a lawyer, and I thought, okay, maybe I should just keep working as a lawyer. Maybe it's the it's the security in that. It's less risky, um, and I can just uh, I can find some find a safe way to live. But um, that's I guess that's one of the other aspects to all this is risk. You often have to leave safety to pursue something because we're all looking for the safe path there. And I think that's what made it really tricky as well. That's what added to that grind, particularly with me, right? Because if I, uh, or at least I thought, if I make a misstep, then um, I'm someone who's got a spinal cord injury. I wasn't financially in a great place at all. We, were, we had zero money. We had nothing behind us. We just had, we had debt. Um, so if I make a misstep, I knew that I would end up in a very difficult, perhaps untenable situation because it's not like, um, you know, say, say I even became homeless, right? It's a very different situation to be homeless with a spinal cord injury. Um, not that it, it would have ever come to that, I don't think, but you can't really just go sleep somewhere in a wheelchair. It's a very, very different thing. All those things were in the back of my mind. So I knew that if I made a misstep, I would become 
very dependent on something to live my life. So all, all those things were really playing in my head. And I think we all have that, like if we're working and if we have family and if we have a mortgage and if we have all these things, then we probably think about safety first to protect all that. But sometimes you have to take a risk. I can 100% relate to that. Um, I, mean, I think Andy and I both can with, you know, we've, we've sort of launched this thing that we're doing and we don't have that safety net of a regular job behind us. So it's about kind of that putting that passion and going, this is something that I feel like I have to do and taking that risk. I think a lot of us can kind of relate to that. The rewards are worth it though, aren't they? <laughs> oh my God. I, I am so grateful for life. Like, Every day I'm going to pinch myself at where we are today. Me and my mum, um, you know, we're a team, we're a little family that's got through this hard time. But every day we're going to pinch ourselves at the different um, experiences that we get to have and the things that we get to see and uh, where we've got to in life. It's something that we never imagined, particularly when I was laying in a, an intensive care bed with the world falling apart around me, I never thought that. I'd be sitting here talking to you right now in this context. It's crazy. Do you feel like that there was an element of calculation in the risk taking with this Dinesh? Or did you really just think, look, I've got nothing to lose. I've basically got to a point where anything could happen now and it couldn't be worse than, than where I am right now. Uh, I think th this was really an unknown. Uh, when I was coming back to medical school, like I knew one guy um, who's a friend of mine now, actually. He had Guillain-Barre syndrome and he, he studied in Sydney, but um, he had a similar level of physical function to me. But before him, there was no one else. There's certainly not been anyone in Queensland. So I didn't know what would happen and, I, and no one knew what would happen. No one knew whether it would work. So it, it was a totally, um, it was a venture into the unknown. And uh, I wish I could say that I could calculate some of the risks, but I had no idea what to expect. So we just dived in and, you know, mom and I, we didn't even know how we would financially support ourselves through that process. You know, one of the things I realized though, is um, we intellectualize some of our decisions to the point of paralysis, mm. which is a uh, ironic thing to say, but uh, you know, you know, cause we, we sometimes just sit there and think about the thousand different outcomes that could happen the thousand different risks, the thousand different, um, you, can, you can see it in some bureaucracies, right? That's why uh, some things move so slowly, bureaucracy, because it's about risk management. Yeah. And I think our lives have become like that as well. It's about risk management. So we intellectualize decisions so much. So I'm not saying that we should throw a caution to the wind and just do ridiculous things. But I'm just saying that um, sometimes we just have to take risks. I remember a um, talk when I was a medical student before the accident from um, Graham Clark, who was the in inventor of the bionic ear. So he had this dream in the 1960s, I think it was, of creating a bionic ear. The technology wasn't there then, but he was an ENT surgeon in a successful practice. He had a big family. He was supporting them. They had money, whatever else. But he had this dream to make the bionic ear. And uh, he set out to do it. He collected money. He said at one point the organization was just collecting money with tins on the street. He gave up all that job security and people were calling him the crazy Graham Clark or something. So people ridiculed him as well. But he had his dream of creating a bionic ear and um, he did. And now today people can hear because of him and because he took that risk, the world has changed. Imagine that people can hear. I think sometimes if you have a dream, it's going to take risk to get there. So I think my, my, yeah, his, uh, his journey actually really touched me and I thought about it a lot when I was going through my own. You, you just got to sometimes just dive in and see what happens. Do you think that your experience has made you a better doctor? I hope so. Um, I hated being a patient. <laughs> hated it. I, I couldn't stand it because... You know, you're in a hospital, right? And uh, you feel so disempowered. You feel out of control. You sometimes don't know what's going on. Uh, and there's this paternalistic attitude sometimes where people are telling you what needs to happen rather than coming to a decision with you. So I know I was in hospital for months, like it was seven months. And uh, even um, 
Let me tell you two simple things matter, right? One of the things that I used to do, and the, this, this was seven months, right? Every day for seven months was um, I used to get up as early as I can to try and get into the bathroom first. Because if you don't get into the bathroom first, they didn't clean the bathroom between patients. Oh. Mm. And so there was like feces everywhere sometimes. It's foul. Mm. And you just go there and, you're, you know, you're trying to get through a spinal cord injury. You're trying to come to terms with paralysis. And you're in this dark old building and you're like, geez, this is like, there's not even a clean bathroom from here anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, so even like simple things like a plain, clean bathroom is nice. So I remember that stuff. And, um, you know, it, it, for, even if it's just offering a patient a warm blanket or getting them a cup of tea, it's really, I, I think it's those things that matter. So I, I try to remember that and I try to remember my experience and hopefully that uh, translates to my patients today. Did you feel like you were heard as a patient? You know, I've, be, I've been in some, literally, I've been in some life and death situations, um, in, particularly in the first part um, when I was recovering from the uh, injury. It's actually overseas for um, some of it. And I wasn't heard. And because I wasn't heard, these complications um, continued to the point where I was medically turned into a train wreck and I was on the verge of death a couple of times. Um, whereas if someone just listened, I probably could have avoided those complications early or at least managed them a bit better. So, um, no, I, I often didn't feel like I was scared. How do we change that in, I suppose, our personal lives, but also in the medical system? Because I often feel like I don't get heard by doctors. Ah, I find, um, you know, there's a, uh, I think what, what's okay. So one of the fundamental things is um, we have become such an inward-looking society, humanity. I don't know why that has happened, but um, the, a part of it is probably we look to social media, we look at um, traditional media. We're at a point, perhaps it's through consumerism or whatever else, but we're, we're at a point where our psyches often look at what we can get, Right. It's about um, what I could buy or how can I look better? How can I feel better? How can I, you know, it's, it's all about me, me, me. Even wellness um, is about a lot of the conversations that we have about wellness is looking inwards. So I don't think the answer to happiness lies with looking inwards because inside we are infinite. And so if we try to feed that infinity for happiness, it's, uh, it's a never-ending thing. You always want more. You always want bigger. You always want something else. You want the next thing. Um, you want to make another body part look better or whatever. And that's a never-ending thing. And the more inward-looking we become, I think the more closed off we get and the more unhappy we get. So I think the true happiness lies in looking outwards. And it's about giving. What can we give to the world? What can we make, do to change it? What can we do to change someone's life? What can we do to help someone? And if we start doing that, like how, how good is it to do a random act of kindness for someone? Like how good does that feel? How fulfilling is that? And if we start doing those things, I think that equals happiness. And then if all of us start doing that for each other, then the, then the whole world changes and the whole world becomes happy. It's so Particularly if you, you know, if we work as a doctor, I think we go to work and um, we look after people. But if we can't also do that in the real world for the people around us, I think we're going to take a deep look at ourselves. Happiness really lies in looking outwards and giving. And I think for health professions, it's more important than ever to take that attitude. Because if you take that attitude to work and if you try to remind yourself why you're doing something, then I think the patient care automatically improves. There are a lot of egos around the uh, medical profession in particular. It's about, you know, we, we know what's right for you and we know this, it's very hierarchical. So there are all these, medicine's really funny. There's, it's like a little social microcosm within itself. There's a hierarchy, there's a social structure, there are 
certain manners and um, etiquette that you must follow. But um, all those things are not necessarily conducive to really caring for our patients. That gets forgotten within that. So if we try to remember some of those things, I think um, care can get better. But these are not things that you can easily teach, I don't think. I just want to come back to your point around, you know, how we perform on social media and so forth as well and how, you know, that act of giving really, you know, from my perspective is something that I've found is actually when it's genuinely done does bring some personal joy. I wonder if, you know, there's a distinction to be made there between doing something out of genuine kindness and what seems to be occurring as to people kind of performing or actually doing something to be seen to be doing the right thing, whether that's kind of something we need to address, do you think? Yeah, it's a fine line, I think, because sometimes you can do something for a personal gain and that's probably where uh, things fall apart. If you're doing something for personal gain, it's probably not uh, truly giving. Um, So if you're just appearing at something or talking about something because you might get a reward for it or something else. That's probably not the, it's probably not the right way to go, but it's just simple stuff. You know, there there are people that we can, even if it's just smiling at someone saying hello, that kind of love and kindness that we can extend to humans. It's so, it's so good. That sense of community. We saw a bit of that coming out during the pandemic when people started coming together. Um, But togetherness is so, so important. So when you say before that I suppose we're all like searching for more and are trying to, you know, keep attaining more, keep doing more, it kind of can lead to unhappiness. How does that reconcile with you who I think has done an incredible amount of things and seems to keep reaching for more? Mm. I mean, m- most of us are lucky to have one degree. You've gone and got two, and <laughs> you, you know, if it, and and now you know you work with trying to work like cure spinal cord injuries. I feel like you're reaching for more as well, and that there's a power yeah. in that too. Well, it's because I have a why about doing those things. I want to cure spinal cord injury because um, because I want to walk again. <laughs> so, yeah. and. Um, I want to. I want to be able to hug my mom again, and I want to stand up again. So that it's a very deep and personal reason, and I want to see people with spinal cord injuries uh, also have that same opportunity to stand up, walk, um, have a life, you know, with, with with physical function like that. And then um, the other things that I do, it's also been driven by a why. Uh, the law degree helps me helps me navigate disability. It helps me fight for people. It helps me understand some of the structures and help change it. Uh, Medicine's, you know, medicine's amazing. I get to go to work every day, get to play a part in people's journeys. And it's such a profoundly human activity. And, you know, last week I was at work, for example, and there was a, a tragic moment with a patient and their family. And I don't think any of us could hold our tears back. But that's a moment that we shared together. And I think that's a privilege to be able to do that. So there's there's a lot of all these things have a why. And the other thing is gratitude. You know, I, um, like I said, I grew up in Sri Lanka. I've seen some other people in that country, well, most other people with spinal cord injuries, they have a pretty difficult life. There's no NDIS, there's no social support, there's no equipment, there's nothing. And so many of them pass away. So here I am in this beautiful country in Gold Coast, looking at the ocean right now, talking to you using a good wheelchair. And what's there not to be grateful about? So gratitude really, you know, helps me uh, wake up in the morning. Mum and I often, we, we only sleep, uh, sometimes we sleep for, I mean, last night we slept about three and a half hours. But it's um, a large part of our energy comes from being grateful. We often talk and think, geez, how lucky are we to be able to do this and do this and do this? So then nothing becomes a chore. Gratitude is another part of it. I'm grateful for all these opportunities I have and I want to make the most of it and I want to make the most of it for the other people that don't have those opportunities. So those things keep me going as well. What um, other 
practices would you say you have in that for being grateful every day? Like, are there any are there any things in the toolkit that maybe you or your mum have to make sure that you're actively practicing that? I think you've got to, you know, with any of these things, you, you've got to keep doing it daily. And it's very easy to forget or it's very easy to slip. I think it's really easy to slip, right? We're often pulled in different directions because there's so much stimulus outside us and um, if you're not vigilant and if you're not mindful about your thought patterns you can slip one way or another so it's about always taking stock and always adjusting the sails to make sure that you're going in the direction that you want and sometimes that's a daily thing I wake up in the morning and uh, I, I've written down some of the things that I'm grateful for so I, I think of a few things that I'm, I'm thankful for and one of the other things actually is to really have a good sense of what you are about. I don't know if you've ever come across the novel, The Count of Monte Cristo, but I read it when I was, when I initially had the accident. So these were days when I was laying in bed uh, a lot and I was looking, looking out into the ocean. I was thinking about what life might be. And I read this book and the story is about this guy back, you know, few hundred years ago he had a great life and a beautiful fiance they were due to be married and people around him betrayed him he ended up in this island prison which was isolating and he lost everything he met this monk in the prison who uh, helped him escape and also told him about a treasure that's hidden he got the treasure and then he reinvented himself as the count of monte cristo this rich amazing person who uh then went and (laughs) sadly took revenge on all the people that betrayed him. So I wasn't so much interested in the revenge part, but I was interested in the reinvention part. So I made a promise to myself that I would come back a better person than uh, I ever was. So I read heaps and heaps of books. And uh, if I may slip something else in, there's a book by Ryan Holiday called Ego is the Enemy. And in that book, he talks about a lifetime and dead time. So when you, when you have, say, an illness or when you're in prison, he uses the example of Malcolm X, who reinvented himself in prison. You can use that time as dead time where you go, okay, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to lament. Or you can use that as a live time and try to make the most of it. So I try to turn it into a live time to read as much as I can and do as much as I can. So I spend that time reinventing myself. And one of the things I did was to think and write down actually what I want to stand for as a person. And those were things like loyalty and perseverance and giving and integrity and all these things. So I've got a list of things that are important to me and a list of things that are who I am about. So that, that's been an important part as well. And I remind myself of that every single day because, you know, you need, to, you need to know what you stand for, right? If you have it written down, if you have a list of at least five things, when you navigate your day-to-day life, you can stop and check, wait, is this, is this congruent with my values? And if it's not, then you need to move on. I think that's really um, important to to outline mm-hmm. there the the values work and doing things in alignment with your values. Um, I'm interested, Dinesh, as well, like with this reinvention that you've been through, how has that changed your relationship to vulnerability? Oh, um, Big question, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's a good question. It's a great question because I used to hate being vulnerable. I hated it. Like mm-hmm. if I even had a cold, I wouldn't let anyone see me with a cold. Um mm-hmm. And uh, I hated being vulnerable, but I don't think uh, vulnerability is actually vulnerability in the traditional sense. It's just about being genuine, right? So sharing what you've been through and sharing it honestly and talking about what you've been honestly, that's just being genuine, I think, and that's just being true to yourself. So if people persecute you for that, I think that's, uh, that's probably, you know, that's probably a reflection on them rather than you, but Vulnerability is not really, I don't think it's about that in the traditional sense. It's just about being genuine and talking about who you are and how you got here. Also, when after I had the accident, I was just a naked guy in a bed. Everyone saw me. I had, <laughs> I had, um, I had zero, uh, zero dignity sometimes. So it, uh, it really changed my perspective on what it's like. Um, you know, one of the, 
things that happen in spinal cord injury is uh, your um, your private stop functioning as normal. And so when I was in the spinal injuries unit, one day I was doing uh, therapy with the physiotherapist and she put me up on a standing frame and suddenly um, the equipment sprung to action without any uh, thought or intention. And then I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's uh, it's not you. I mean, it would be you, but, you know, I, I just uh, – and then she's like, oh, no, no, it's okay. It happens to everyone. You mentioned before when you were at law school that you were, you know, depressed and you were suffering anxiety. To me, depression often sometimes is very debilitating. Like, I mean, mm. it's one of the worst things that I have experienced. So it's interesting that you use the spinal cord time to work on your alive time. But when you were in law school, you were depressed and I assume in that case, like you were struggling to kind of function. Yeah. So this is a, uh, this is a really good um, point. And it's something that I often reflect on and share. And that is, you know, I have quadriplegia now. So my body is uh, very different and um, it might uh, change the things I do. But depression was far more debilitating than the spinal cord injury ever has been. Because I think when you're a prisoner of your mind, when you can't get out of your own head and you're stuck, like I've got a friend going through it right now and it's so debilitating for her. Mm. She's just, um, you know, she's struggling at work and whatever else. So I think when you have your mind, you are, you can be more powerful than ever and you can do anything. But if you are stuck and if your mind is not with you, then that's very debilitating. So I've, I've had the benefit of being able to compare both experiences. And, uh, yeah, I can safely say that uh, depression is far more debilitating than spinal cord injury has been. Knowing what you know now, what would you say to Dinesh, the law student who was suffering depression? Oh, I just tell him to keep going. Um, look, I... I'd, I'd say that everything will be okay. But one of the things with depression is that it's incredibly isolating. And I think um, it's very hard for people around you to get through to you. And I think it's, um, it's very hard to be receptive and it's very hard to be open to that as well. I think persistence is the biggest thing. So if I had to say something to that, Dinesh, I'd probably just try and persist and try and be there. Having said that, it's uh, it can get frustrating for people around someone with disability with uh, depression because, you know, you're trying and trying and trying and you feel like uh, there's no engagement. But, you know, it's a, it's a difficult journey for someone and it's so isolating. So I think it's important to just keep trying. What did you do to move out of that at the time? It took me a long time. I had some medical underlying medical issues as well. So I was anemic. I got diagnosed with celiac disease at the time. So starting to treat those helps. And I think with, with depression, it's important to look for an underlying cause first that's medically addressable. But the other big one, huge one for me was finding my why. Um, because I, I didn't have a why. Like I didn't, I didn't have a reason I didn't have um, something that was close to my heart and it was through that ironically through the depression that I found my why which was medicine and people that love was actually found after going through depression so um, it was a combination of those two things but I think you know I am extremely grateful for that experience even though it was one of the hardest things I've gone through um, it helped me find my why and it helped me find medicine and I'm forever thankful for that. Dinesh, I'm also interested in what you're doing with the legal side of things as well because you are an advocate for doctors with disabilities and really trying to bring the spotlight onto uh, merit and focusing on what people focusing on what people can do rather than trying to limit them because of what they appear not to be able to do on the surface. Can you tell us a little bit about that work you're doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, the uh, work around doctors and disabilities is really like, it's bigger than that now. So it's around people with disabilities. 
But um, medicine was an important place to start because I was trying to become a doctor and I had a disability. So we needed to, we wanted to change how the medical profession saw disability and how they treated people with disabilities within the profession. It's so important to have a diversity of people, particularly within medicine, because um, I, I think I was at a discussion maybe a few weeks ago. And one of the questions that came up was, what do we need to do to generate new ideas in the medical profession? And I'm like, you just need a diverse group of people thinking uh thinking so um it's important to have that but the attitudes have been pretty uh traditional so to speak in medicine and it's not just disability but there's still gender issues um some of my female colleagues have some issues navigating their careers mm-hmm. um and that there are Although I haven't experienced it, particularly during COVID, I saw some uh, racial issues as well. Um, so some of my uh, colleagues of Asian heritage were affected. So I think it's important to try and navigate these things. And uh, it's just, we, we've made a lot of headway. So with disability in particular, the um, medical education institutions have started changing their approach nationally, both in Australia and New Zealand, and we made headway in the United States, UK, India. We've played a part in some of those conversations. Employment is starting to change as well. The Australian Medical Association has now put out a position statement encouraging the inclusion of doctors with disabilities in the workplace. So all those things have been great and all those things are starting to change. So that also has a flow and effect to other professions as well. So we've had Uh, discussions with allied health professionals, paramedics, nursing, and all these other people about that. So it's been good. But um, through that, we've had input into conversations like how people with disabilities are treated during COVID-19, because there were a lot of barriers like healthcare rationing, even food access was an issue. So this has given us a platform to speak to those issues and have some input in it. And it's expanded really to uh, advocating for people with disabilities now, which is a real privilege. Does it feel like the conversation is now taking a more proactive angle rather than a reactive response? Yeah, I think so. It's starting to. There's no excuse not to now, I think. See, it's important that society, right? It's important that people, our community comes together and talks about things that we believe are right or wrong. And disability has been one of those conversations. Gender has been one of those conversations. Uh, we've seen things like Black Lives Matter, Me Too. So that, for this, for society to come together and say, you know what, this is what we believe in, and we want the institutions to change. Um, that That's a really powerful thing. Because what we forget is that institutions are accountable to the people. Politicians are accounted to the people. Governments are accounted to the people. So if the people come together and talk about an issue in unity, then those institutions are forced to change. And I think that's important. It's important that people have these conversations. It's important that people have these movements. It's important that we, as a grassroots, move our ideals forward because we can't always trust institutions to do that. Our voices make a difference, individually and collectively. Yeah, they're powerful. I just wanted to go back to when you were talking about gratitude, Dinesh, um, and and how you and your mum practice that kind of gratitude every day. Is there a way that you practice that with your patients as well? Like, can you kind of talk them into a more gratitude-feeling place about their experience? Or is that too much insertion into, you know, trying to make them feel a certain way but is there is there a way that you can kind of impart that to help them on that journey too i think um everything's relative people's experiences are different and someone's experience for a certain thing might be so significant to them whereas to another person it might seem very trivial so i never use my experience or i never kind of take that into into the interaction if someone's going through something they're going through something and it's, it's probably going to be hard for them. My job really is just to try and help them through that the best way I can. And often that's, um, you know, that's just to be with them and to make some shared decisions and to figure out what we can do best together. I, I think you just got to be empathetic to what someone's going through and be there for them. I love that though, because I always think, you know, 
grief is grief, bad is bad. Whatever it is you're feeling that about, that emotion is the same, even if the actual baseline circumstance is different. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing about being a doctor is you see many patients through the day, right? That's your job. But you always got to step back and remember that while you're doing a job and seeing all these patients, for most of those patients, it's or for at least some of them, potentially the most significant event that they've ever had in their life. You've, you've kind of got to step back and remember that as well. I've seen pa- patients being diagnosed with cancer in the ED or having a heart attack or a stroke. For them, that is probably one of the biggest events that they've ever had in their whole life. Um, help them through that, but we have to keep moving on to the next patient because it's uh, the cogs keep turning into a never-ending machine. We've got to try and remember that. And, and a part of that is really just empathy and being there with them. Is there a moment that stands out to you, perhaps I think in a patient interaction sense, that I've made the right decision, this is me following my why, and it's all led me to yeah. this place and it's all worked out beautifully? Is there? Yeah, I have that all the time. Super lucky. I, I get to do that all the time, every day. But um, there have been some particular instances where I've, you know, that, that are burned into my memory. I guess one of the nice ones was when I came across a patient, it was like 2 a.m., they had a significant disability and I was their doctor. So I wandered into their cubicle and the first thing they said was, I'm so glad that you rolled into my room because I knew you would understand my situation. So we had this great moment and we uh, we were able to uh, get them through what they needed. So that was so nice. And um, I think it was probably one of the one of the nicest moments that I've had in medicine. I um, also want to sort of expand on this topic of gratitude and also looking out for what supports us with our goals because um, a part of your story is how supportive and also encouraging the um, the university was in bringing you back to complete your study in medicine. So what, what kind of balance do you think is important or do you think it's more important to surround yourself with that supportive network or did you actually really have to go inside to find that that strength to follow your passion? You know, no person is an island. We're all, we're all a part of this fabric that makes up humanity. And I think it's important to surround yourself with people that believe in what you believe and that will support you through what, uh, what you believe. So <laughs> sometimes no matter how crazy the idea is, I think that's really made a big difference in my life. So last year, late last year, I got the opportunity to give something to the National Museum of Australia for the Australian of the Year Awards. And it was an object that's of significance to me. So the object I chose was one of my scrub tops and I got the people that have played a part in my journey to sign it. Mm -hmm. So there are signatures from everyone from the fireman that cut me out of the car to the surgeon that operated on me to uh, the educators that took me through medical school to my mom, to my friends. So I think um, for me, that's really symbolic because we are a product of the people around us and the people around us leave an imprint on our lives forever and they made me who I am. So it's got Dr. Dinesh Palapana written on the scrub top. So they were responsible for helping to create that person. So to surround yourself with such people and to acknowledge them and celebrate them is really important. Celebrate the people around you. You have to. It, it's, uh, you know, we, we are who we are because of them. And can we talk about how awesome your mum is? What an oh, incredible woman. <laughs> she is the best. So she's, um, she's an amazing woman. She's strong. She's patient. She's kind. Um, you know, even when I get grumpy, which I do sometimes, <laughs> she's um, just so patient with me. So she, she's incredible. And we, you know, we, we both family. Very grateful for her that she gave birth to me, but also everything subsequent to that. It's been a fascinating conversation, Dinesh. Like, I, I really, we could talk for hours because, um, you know, you, you've been very generous with your time today and we really appreciate it as well. Very grateful for that, you know, considering, you know, your busy schedule from day to day and, and what you do. It's very humbling to have somebody like yourself um, come on and, and have a chat to us. And congratulations on the Australian of the Year Award, I must say, as well. 
How did that make you feel? Oh, pretty incredible. It was uh, surreal, actually. You know, I still got to pinch myself every day. <laughs> you, like I said, you know, you just never expect life to take you to these uh, positions. You know, I'm uh, I'm very lucky. I'm very grateful. Hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today, uh, Dinesh. We really, really appreciate this. And um, when we saw you and your smiling face, we knew we had to talk to this person because you <laughs> light up the room with uh, – you, you can see the joy and the happiness radiating from you. And I, I think oh, that's truly beautiful. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. You're, uh, I re- I'm really uh, – I really had a great chat. It was, it was good. It made me think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which is <Excellent>. always nice. <laughs> We've promised we're going to cut out the platitudes, so let's start with the hard stuff first. Dinesh told us that he felt experiencing depression was worse than sustaining a spinal cord injury. In the next episode, we'll start to explore the difference between depression and a bad mood and continue the push against toxic positivity. This isn't about good vibes only. It's about getting to the heart of who we are and making a sustainable change for ourselves. Next time on Reframe of Mind, Associate Professor Kimberly Norris from the School of Psychological Sciences at the University of Tasmania joins us as we talk about depression. The neurochemicals in your brain literally are not in balance. When we're talking about depression, for example, we have too little of certain chemicals such as serotonin or too little of chemicals like dopamine, which is, if you like, a little feel-good mm. chemical. And so it's not that people aren't trying, it's literally that the chemicals in their brain won't let them think their way out of it. If you're concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional advice and support. You can contact Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or at beyondblue.org.au. Or you can contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or lifeline.org.au. More resources can be found on our website. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. For more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production.